Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to church. Thanks for coming. Welcome also to you who are joining us on Zoom this morning. I hope you're going okay and you'll be able to join us in person again very soon. You are missed when you are not here. So, welcome. Brothers and sisters, we whom God calls by name into his eternal family prioritize gathering together. In fact, when we gather together, it is a foretaste of heaven. Though the world throws up many competing distractions, we mustn't let anything stand between us and meeting with our God and with each other. So let me say again, welcome to you all. It's wonderful to be here with you. I want to read a couple of verses from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, or even hear, you saints of Eagle Vale Anglican Church, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And from chapter 7, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be his special people, treasured above all peoples who are on the face of the earth. Praise him. Please bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are reminded by the prophet Jeremiah that you are a jealous God and a God who is jealous for your chosen people, having mercy on us in a way that we do not deserve, loving us in a way that defies our understanding and saving us from eternal condemnation despite our sin. Let us not provoke you to anger by either our spiritual apathy or our unrestrained pursuit of anything other than you. Come now, Father, we ask. Come amongst us in the person of your Holy Spirit. And as we meet, we ask that you will teach us challenge us, rebuke us, and encourage us for our good and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Please stand and we'll sing our first song. The heavens sing. Indeed they do. Let's join. Sing of Christ the praise resounds on earth below. O heart, arise the tune of grace, is life unto my soul. Lift your voice, join the angels, join the angels' song.
be seen. The uh, children and youth are going to go out. Let me pray for them. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us into a relationship with you. You've called us all. You've called our children. Father, please, now as they go out, Lord, enable the teachers to, uh, to uh, speak clearly and speak well, speak of you, speak of your love. Lord, and may seeds of the gospel be sown that in the fullness of time will bear fruit for your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, they've gone. That was a long prayer then. <laughs> okay. Note to self, shorter prayer when the children are going out. Okay, we're going to hear from God's word. We're going to, uh, Graham's going to preach to us from Daniel chapter 7. And and Rhonda, you're coming out the front, are you, dear? Excellent. She's very cheeky, Rhonda, you know. Yes. Come on out, read to us. Uh, we love each other. Yes, yes. I could, could have sat in there. Okay. This morning's reading comes from Daniel chapter 7, and I'm reading, reading the whole of the passage. Okay. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was laying in his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beats, each different from the others, come up from the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were worn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims, and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and, there, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing, clothing was as white as snow, and the hair on his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was, flow, was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. 
In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away. And his kingdom was one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled, troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing near and asked them the meaning of this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beach, beast, which was different and from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast that crushed and devoured its victim, victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favour of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come out of this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue the three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the, the time set and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and half a time but the court <clears throat> the court will sit and its power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever then the sovereignty power and greatness of all kingdoms under heaven will be handed <clears throat> excuse me over to the holy people <clears throat> of the most high his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. This is the word of the Lord. That's a long reading, isn't it? Just as well, it wasn't too much longer. The voice was starting to get out, I think. Thanks, Rhonda. Thank you for reading that to us. Let's pray as we turn to God's word. Father, we ask that you would speak to us through your word and uh, help us to hear what you are saying to us this morning, uh, that we might be encouraged to stand firm as your people. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure that we've all uh, been enjoying these stories from the book of Daniel Uh Daniel and his three friends, you remember, have been taken from their homeland to Babylon uh, where their wisdom and their courage to stand before God uh, sees them rise through the ranks of the, the, the community and uh, serve the king and their unyielding faith in the one true God. Uh, even in the midst of opposition and persecution and the threat of death uh, is inspiring to us. Chapter 7, though, uh, things take a bit of a turn in a different direction, and we find it quite strange and puzzling. 
uh, many of you will realize, of course, that this is the last in our series from the book of Daniel. So uh, if you want to find out more about chapters 8, 9, 10, and whatever it is that it goes up to, uh, you'll have to read on yourself, and I encourage you to do that. But it's a strange kind of um, material. You remember we heard back in the early chapters about Nebuchadnezzar's strange dream? I uh, remember the, the bizarre statue uh, and how Daniel was able to explain to the king what it meant. Uh, and then a couple of chapters later, there's the king's second dream where he dreams of that tree that's cut down and how that's fulfilled in a period of insanity for the king. But now in chapter 7, we find that it's Daniel himself who has this strange and quite disturbing dream. And it begins with these four beasts. And there's something about that that kind of reminds us about Nebuchadnezzar's dream with the four different materials, the, the head of gold and the, the chest and arms of silver and the belly and thigh of bronze and the legs and the feet, a uh, mixture of clay and iron. Uh, notice that this dream that Daniel has happens during the reign of King Belshazzar. Now, he's the one who comes between Nebuchadnezzar, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, and Darius, chapter 6. Belshazzar, you remember, is the one that saw the writing on the wall. Uh, so we've kind of stepped back a little bit in history here as we come to chapter 7. If you've ever read the book of Revelation in the New Testament, uh, and not just the first couple of chapters, but right through into the, the book of Revelation, uh, you'll realize that the, some of the strange visions that come up in the book of Revelation bear a remarkable similarity to what we have in the second half of the book of Daniel. Uh, and you may be aware that there's a technical name for this type of liter literature. It's called apocalyptic. Uh, and perhaps the main thing for us to remember as we think about this particular and quite distinctive style of writing that seems to us quite puzzling is that its aim is, in fact, to reveal, uh, to explain, uh, to prepare God's people, and most importantly of all, to bring comfort and reassurance to believers as they go through what may be a very challenging and difficult time, a time when the whole world just seems to be in utter turmoil. So Daniel records the content of this dream, I don't know whether you call it a dream or a vision, that he has. And it begins with this beastly dream of earthly power. Uh, verse 2, he says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven, churning up the great sea, and four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. And then he describes these beasts uh, in more detail, and the descriptions, the way he describes it, seem bizarre at the very least. Uh, we can try and visualise what it is that he's describing, and uh, perhaps those who are more artistic than me, which wouldn't take much, can try and depict it. I thought it would be interesting if you put that description into an AI and to see what sort of picture it would come up with. It would be quite remarkable, I think. In a way, what he sees defies description in words. And he's looking for sort of the nearest thing that he can think of to describe them. But in a sense, words really fail him. Uh, the first one. He's not a lion, but he says it is like a lion. Yet it had the wings of an eagle, which are then torn off and it's lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human was given to it. It's a picture of strength, of great power. Animal on the one hand and yet almost human as well. Uh, the second beast is like a bear. Uh, the Syrian brown bear, apparently, uh, can weigh up to 250 kilograms uh, and a voracious appetite. And this beast that he sees is devouring flesh and bones. Pretty gruesome picture, isn't it? And then the third beast, he says, is like a leopard. 
But again, it's it's not like any ordinary kind of leopard. It has four wings like those of a bird uh, and four heads. So it's watching in every di- direction at the same time and it's ready to pounce on its prey. Notice that it is given authority to rule. That's the message that Daniel has been trying to get through to the kings under which he has served, that they had power and authority only because and only for as long as it is given, it is given to them by God. And there's great encouragement, isn't it? Even these terrifying beasts only have power so much as God gives it to them. So if the first beast is like a lion, the second is like a bear, and the third is like a leopard, the fourth, I think we'd have to say it's like nothing known to mankind. Uh, This beast, this fourth one, is in a league of its own. Terrifying, frightening, very powerful, it says, with Iron teeth, it crushed and devoured its victims and it had ten horns and it gets even more terrifying. While I was thinking about the horn, says Daniel, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. Now, there's a clue that we have that in this kind of apocalyptic writing, a horn on an animal, that kind of a horn, not not you know, that you blow with your horn on the steering wheel, a horn that sort of comes out of the head of an animal. They always represent power uh, and authority. It represents a king, a ruler, strength, power, greatness. But these horns that Daniel sees, they're not kind of benevolent dictators. This last horn, although it's little, is seen by Daniel to uproot three of the others and it says it has eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now, we'll come with Daniel in a moment to the explanation of this dream. But just for a moment, try and put yourself in Daniel's shoes as this happens, as he sees this dream. I reckon as he that stirs from his dream and wakes. His heart is thumping in his chest from what he's seen. The adrenaline is pumping through his system. This is indeed a terrifying and beastly dream of great and frightening, terrifying earthly power, power that has set itself up in arrogant defiance of God and in fierce and ruthless opposition to those who are the people of God. But before we get to an explanation of all of this, there's a very abrupt change in focus. It's as if the camera has sort of swung through 180 degrees and we find that Daniel is looking at something in a very different direction. His gaze is drawn upward to heaven. And he's given this reassuring vision of God, a reassuring vision of God in all his heavenly splendor. Uh, So look with me again and see if you can start to feel uh, something of what is happening for Daniel as he is torn between this terrifying vision of what he sees happening on earth to this greatly encouraging vision of what he sees as he looks to heaven. From verse 9. He says, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. And it goes on to say his throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze and a river of fire was flowing coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. And then it continues, the court was seated and the books were opened. So he's talking about thrones, talks about thrones in heaven. This is 
where the real seat of power lies. It is heaven. It is God himself. It says, the ancient of days took his seat. It's a way of speaking, of course, about God. Not hard to figure that out. The, the, the one true God, the creator, the one who has control and power over all things, he is seated. That's significant. What we do not see is some kind of epic supernatural struggle between God and the powers of evil. You see, which one is going to prevail in the end as if there's some kind of uncertainty? It's not a kind of cosmic conflict between God and all the powers of good and the evil one and all the powers of evil. To see which one is going to prevail. Will God be stronger? Will the powers of evil be stronger? It's, it's not a picture of God frantically trying to work out his battle strategy so that he can get ahead of the evil one. The Ancient of Days took his seat. He sits. It's done. Well, what a great comfort this is to Daniel and indeed to us. Uh, what an extraordinary reassurance these words are to us in the midst of all the turmoil and the craziness and the chaos of the world in which we live, in which there are many of these beasts that are trying to use their powers for evil. But this very reassuring vision of God in all his heavenly splendour is not something to be taken lightly. It says his throne was flaming with fire and his wheels are all ablaze and a river of fire flowing, coming out from before him. This is a picture of God's judgment. Fire. Nothing can stand in its way. It's like a terrifying picture of a, an erupting volcano, the, the lava just flowing out before it. But Daniel still has one eye on what's happening on earth and these beasts, and especially this last horn from verse 11. Uh, then I continue to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. So in heaven, the court was seated. God himself is seated. Yeah. On earth, these beasts are disempowered. They are defeated. Ultimately, they are destroyed. But the real action still is in heaven. And there's this new figure that comes into the vision that Daniel sees. And, and we, as followers of Jesus and who have read our New Testament, will remember immediately the way that Jesus so often referred to himself. And so we will sit up and we'll take very careful notice when we read this. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming of the clouds of heaven, and he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. You remember how Jesus often referred to himself as the Son of Man? And when we read that in the New Testament, our English versions have a capital S and a capital M, the Son of Man, because Jesus used it as a title for himself. But here in the Old Testament, it's just a small s and a small m, a Son of Man. And in the Old Testament, often that's just simply a way of talking about someone who is human. Uh, in Psalm 8, 
uh, uses it this way, although the newer version of the NIV has kind of lost this a little bit. It says, what is man or mankind that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him? But notice the way that Daniel describes him here. He described the first beast as like a lion, the second as like a bear, the third as like a leopard. And now he describes this very clearly important figure in heaven as being like a son of man. There's something human about him. And yet he is different to any other man. It says he's coming with the clouds of heaven. He's led into the presence of God, God on the throne in heaven. And whereas all those beasts had been granted limited power, limited authority for a limited period of time, this son of man is given permanent and absolute authority and glory and sovereign power. And unlike any other human nations and people of every language will worship him. Remember how deeply offended Daniel's friends were when Nebuchadnezzar commanded that everyone bow down and worship his statue or be thrown into the fiery furnace. Or indeed how Daniel uh, was willing to be thrown into the lion's den rather than to pray to Darius the king. And yet here is one like a son of man whom people worship. They worship him as God. That's amazing, isn't it? I wonder what Daniel made of that. How confronting and strange this image was. We wonder what those people who first read these words of Daniel must have thought about this son of man, one like a son of man whom people will worship. We don't have to wonder, though, what Jesus made of that. Remember when Jesus was arrested and he was brought before the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders and in Mark chapter 14, uh, it tells us how those chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were desperately trying to get evidence against Jesus so they could persuade the Romans to put Jesus to death. And Jesus had been stubbornly silent before the high priest until the, the high priest puts a question directly to him uh, and says, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus replies, I am. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And there's not a shadow of doubt that Jesus, as he spoke, had in mind this very passage from Daniel chapter 7. And it was central to Jesus' understanding of who he was and what his role was in the world. And the high priest certainly saw that. Uh, he, he was appalled that Jesus would make this claim about himself. And the high priest was convinced this is blasphemy. And indeed, it would have been blasphemy except for the fact that it was true. It was true of Jesus. So we have this reassuring vision of God in his heavenly splendor. But Daniel is still troubled by what is seen in this vision, and he's still looking for an explanation. What he received was a dis disturbing explanation of human history, a disturbing explanation of human history. He's told in simple terms, verse uh, 17, the four great beasts of four great kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. 
So in a way, it is a bit similar, isn't it, to Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the statue of the four kingdoms represented by the gold and the silver and the bronze and the, the mixture of clay and iron. Mm -hmm. And most of the experts uh, understand that the lion-like beast represents the Babylonian kingdom, uh, the bear-like beast represents the Medo-Persian kingdom, uh, the leopard-like beast describes the Greek Empire. Uh, the fourth one is a little more complicated. Uh, and some uh, of the experts think that it's referring to the Kingdom of Rome, uh, although the empire with the ten horns and the other horns, it all appears to suggest that this fourth beast is a bit different and sort of broader in scope and perhaps refers to numerous kings and kingdoms that will come and go over the course of human history. So Daniel has some more questions about this fourth beast and all these horns, but perhaps rather than trying to pin down exactly which human king and kingdom is represented by each of the beasts and the horns and, and all the rest of it, the important thing is for us to see that right throughout the flow of human history, Human powers will come and they will go. They will rise and they will fade. We see that again and again. None of them lasts forever. And often these human powers will rise up against God and against God's people. Uh, look with me at just some of it from verse 20. It speaks of the horn that looked more imposing than the others and had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. It was waging war against the holy people, even defeating them, but only until the ancient of days came and pronounced judgment. Uh, verse 25, uh, this last horn or king, however you want to think about it, will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, a time, and half a time. Again, terrible oppression, very real persecution of God's people, mm -hmm. but only for as long as God allows it to take place. Then, verse 26, the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Do you see the, the comfort and the reassurance in this? Especially for people who are suffering immensely, there's this power against them, but only for a while, and then destroyed forever. This is the end of the matter, says Daniel. It concludes the account in verse 28. There's nothing more that Daniel saw or heard or had to report from this pretty disturbing dream vision that he has. But, you know, I think there's more to those words. This is the end of the matter. When Jesus was on the cross and he breathed his last, do you remember what he said? It is finished. It's done. It's completed. There's, there's nothing further that needs to be done. God's plan, God's purpose had been perfectly fulfilled in the death of Jesus. Daniel is, is still deeply troubled as he thinks about all of this. And, and we are, or I think we should be, disturbed as we look at the world around us, uh, back when we were looking at Chapter 3, I mentioned Open Doors, that great Christian organisation that supports believers who are facing extreme persecution. And they have that this map that highlights the 50 most dangerous countries to be a follower of Jesus in. And there are over 300 million Christians who are facing today intimidation, the possibility of prison or even death because of their faith in Jesus. And I, I think, you know, our own country is it's not getting any easier, is it? 
uh, I sometimes what, wonder what it would be like for my grandchildren and great grandchildren and great great grandchildren, perhaps. What it would be like for them to be a follower of Jesus? And even apart from this overt persecution because of our Christian faith, we shouldn't underestimate the impact, the profound impact of living in this broken and God-rejecting world. Nor should we underestimate the powers of the evil one, whether that's through world leaders, tyrants, dictators, despots, or those people in our own communities who perpetrate the atrocities that we hear about on the news and sometimes impact us personally in different ways. Daniel is troubled by what he sees. And we should be troubled as we look at the world around us and as we reflect on the future of human history. And we should pray. We should pray especially for those who are profoundly impacted by the evil in this world. But this suffering and distress and persecution, it's very real. But it is not the end of the matter. That's the immense comfort and reassurance in this admittedly strange kind of apocalyptic writing that we find in the second half of Daniel. The end of the matter is that the great and all-powerful God will prevail. There is no doubt about that. He is seated in heaven. He has overcome the evil one. All the powers of evil in this world one day will be gone. Gone forever. But we who are God's people, God's people through faith, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be part of his everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that lasts forever and forever. And that is a message of immense comfort for God's people. Father, we come before you this morning and we look at the world around us and we see so much suffering and evil, so much that does not bring honour and glory to your name. Father, we thank you that you have conquered all of that evil. And there will come a time when all evil will be removed from this world. We thank you that we are your people. We thank you we are your people now. And through Jesus, the one who is the Son of Man, whom we worship, we can have that wonderful gift of life through him. And help us to stand firm as did Daniel and his three friends. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
him coming on the clouds of wonderful it is to sing out to the Lord. How wonderful it is to hear you all singing. We can hear you singing and it lifts our hearts as we play as well. Praise the Lord. Would Let's uh, say this prayer together, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God of everlasting love, you generously provide all things for us. We pray for people everywhere. Make your way known to them. Your saving power among all nations. Especially we pray for the country of Italy. Once so central to the going out of the gospel, now, sadly, it is more likely that New Age beliefs or even Satanism will be preached. Traditional faiths diminish and are more cultural than they are actually Christ-centric. While eight out of ten people claim to be Christian, only around three out of ten are practising. As with so many peoples, Italians have mostly turned their back on you, provoking most justifiably your wrath and anger. Yet, Lord, we ask again, and based on your promise and your mercy, that you would turn again to the faithful remnant in Italy and empower their labours for your name's sake. Lord, in particular, we pray for the workers to support, uh, for workers, additional workers to support established missionary organisations working within student bodies of many universities. Lord, we pray for the work of the GBU, that is the University Biblical Groups, an arm of the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students that you will cause their mission to prosper and for many students to hear and believe the good news of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we pray for the welfare of your church here on earth, 
guide and govern it by your good spirit so that all who call themselves Christians may be led in the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Father, we especially pray for Kanishka, our Archbishop, Peter, our Bishop, and Steve, our lead pastor. As Steve returns from leave, we ask that you will have refreshed his vision and strengthened him for the work that you have both prepared for him in advance and equipped him for. In Jesus' name, amen. We commend to your fatherly goodness all who are afflicted or distressed in body, mind, or circumstances. Especially we pray for Richard and Gloria at the sudden passing of Richard's brother, Andrew. We pray for Judith DeMarco, a former member of our church here, who is now grieving the passing of her husband, Peter. May you surround her with your love and the pastoral care of her Christian brothers and sisters. We also lift up those amongst us who are living with the daily reality of serious disease. Some particular prayers people have asked for. Now, the first one is for George who is dying in hospital with, of a brain tumour, and we want to pray for his wife, Kerry. Um, who, who is that? Um, you wrote that, did you die? Who are these folk that we know? Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Ah, oh, good on you. All right, well, let's pray for George. Heavenly Father, we pray for George, your child, who in the midst of most difficult circumstances, Lord, is naturally and reasonably distracted from his faith. Lord, we ask that you will strengthen him. Lord, we ask you that you will ease his pain. Lord, we pray for his wife, Kerry. So very hard to sit by, to stand by when the, uh, I guess, the love of your life is struggling in such a way. We lift them up to you. Now, Cecilia's asked for prayer as well. Lord, we pray for Cecilia's family for their spiritual life. Lord, we ask that you will strengthen them to believe in Jesus. And Sharon Francis is um, going for an operation. Is he? Yep. Hi, Sharon. Yep, so uh, on the 28th, is it? Okay, good. Father, we pray for Francis. We thank you that he is your child. And Lord, we pray that you will enable the surgeons to work with diligence and care. And this removal of his gallbladder will bring about uh, a health and vitality that has escaped him in recent times. And Lord, we pray for Fran's father. Father, so many, so many illnesses uh, and, and issues that uh, Fran's dad is uh, suffering. Lord, we lift him up to you, uh, the great physician. Lord, we pray above all things that you will call him by name and he will hear you and call you Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, all these things, please Relieve these folk according to you, uh, to their needs. Give them patience in their sufferings and deliver them from all their afflictions. 
And all these things, all this we ask for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Graham. This morning we're going to share together in the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to express our faith in this very physical way, uh, our faith in God and the to reflect on the, the wonderful gift of life that we have through Jesus and his death on the cross for us. Uh, can I say that if you're a follower of Jesus, whatever your church affiliation may be, you're very welcome to join us in sharing in the bread and the cup. Uh, if, if you're not quite sure if this is where you're at, you're not quite sure whether you're a follower of Jesus at this time, uh, feel free just to sort of indicate to the people as they bring the bread and the cup around that you prefer not to do that. And I just encourage you to use the time to reflect on God's love and his great goodness. We, of course, who are followers of Jesus, know that we fall short and we need to confess our sins and ask for his forgiveness. And so as we prepare to come to the Lord's table to share in this communion, we do that. And I invite you to join with me in the words of this prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has promised to forgive the sins of all who turn to him in faith and repentance, have mercy on us, pardon and free us from all our sins, and strengthen us in doing good and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise and thank you, Heavenly Father, for every spiritual blessing in Jesus our Lord, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins, the gift of your Spirit, and the hope of sharing in your glory. We who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of your Son, Therefore, we lift our voices to praise you, saying, Glory be to God in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. We thank you, Father, that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup. And again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who eat and drink them, believing our Saviour's word, may share his body and blood. We eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord to proclaim our fellowship in his death. We do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Stuart and Sue and Dave will bring the bread to you. Just hold on to it, uh, and then we'll eat together. Then I'll bring the cup. Just hold on to the cup again, and we'll drink together. They can do this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Bring this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Let us pray. 
Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. Okay, everyone, we are going to have a bush dance soon on the 19th of August, Saturday night. We will have a dinner together and bush dancing. We used to have bush dances regularly, but we haven't had one for 10 years. And bush bands don't seem to be around very much nowadays. But young George was in the bush band that used to come and do our bush dances. And he's got to, together with the team and they're going to come out and do a bush dance for us. <laughs> so it's a really great time of getting together having a bit of fellowship having a meal together I know some of us feel like we can't dance anymore because I know my knees don't work as well as they used to but even if you can't dance it's still a great time listening to the music watching people make a fool of themselves as they do their dancing and uh, having dinner together so please come along no matter what age you are and it's also something you can invite other people along to, and we'd love to see other people come along. So please be thinking, who can I invite to come to a bush dance? And next week we'll have flyers that you can give out to people and invite them along. So we're looking forward to a really great evening. It uh, at times ends up being a very sweaty evening, <laughs> but it is a great time together. Thanks. Now, don't be off-put if you don't have your own bush. We will have bushes here for you. That's what it was, wasn't it, sir? <laughs> Let's sing our last song together. Please stand. We belong to the day, the day that is to come, the day that we heard some about this morning. We belong to the day.
as a mighty rock, a refuge in the coming wrath. The heart of the bride belongs to Jesus. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much for coming over the last seven weeks. And uh, God has used you to preach powerfully from Daniel, and we've enjoyed it and benefited from it. Thank you. Heather, thanks for sharing your husband with us. Behind every great man is an even greater woman. <laughs> to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Please join us for morning tea.